Good morning. My name is Peter and I'm Wayne's apprentice. <laughs> nice to be back. <laughs> Quite a few years ago, though we will not discuss how many, a young woman Upon hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and receiving an invitation to believe for the very first time, did so and received the spirit of Jesus in what she could only describe as an emotional conversion. Not everyone has those, but they do occur. She emerged from that encounter so absolutely thrilled and fervent about her faith that she went home and read the Bible every weekend, all weekend. <laughs> As she gathered up all her brothers and sisters and took them to church, whichever one she could find, and had difficulty finding one that particularly understood what in the world was going on with her, because fervency wasn't exactly what they were used to. On one particular occasion, so overflowing with what the Bible calls the joy of the Lord, she went to her closet Sunday morning and got out a little black dress and put it on. And her best stilettos with a bit of lace showing through because you dress up when you go to church, right? And when you're coming before the Lord and a big broad brimmed summer straw hat with a big flowered uh, uh, black ribbon rose on it and did her makeup looking as good as she know how to look. She went to the local brethren assembly and volunteered to teach Sunday school. Many of you are not familiar with the Brethren Assembly, but I can tell you this, every single woman in that soul of conservatism church was wearing twice what she was that morning. And as she walked up to the chief elder, for that's who leads it, and volunteered to teach Sunday school, he, realizing the ripples her presence was creating, took her firmly by the elbow, showed her to the door, and ushered her outside and said kindly, thank you, we don't need you to teach Sunday school. Leaving her still again confused as to why she couldn't find any church that understood what was going on. That eventually got sorted out. And I should tell you that a man came along, a young man, not too long after that, and noticed her fervency of spirit and the little black dress. And I married her. <laughs> and yes, I do have her permission to say that. She had a good chuckle and said, yeah, tell him. And yesterday in Value Village, she pulled off the rack a little black dress and said, something like this one. But you can hear a congregation that wasn't ready for what God was doing out there in the world saying, who let her in? She creates um, problems for us. Long before that. God had chosen a people for himself and said to them, if you follow me, number one, I want you to be circumcised in every male member. And number two, there are commandments I want you to follow. And among them, there will be commandments about uncleanness, what you are to eat and not eat, what you are to do with your sexuality, who you're associating with and who you're not associating with. That is how you will know who you are. And the further they went in life, the more important it was to these people called the Jews to observe these things, especially when they were scattered among the nations, and all of this wasn't easy because everybody did it. Nobody else did it, and it became so important to follow those rules. And so they did. And so there were things that they never ate, and they stuck out like a sore thumb in so many different places. But it was important for their identity, their existence, to follow those commandments. And in fact, after a long time away from their own native land when they came back to it and discovered that they were now living everywhere in a mixed multitude of people, the separation that existed began to become, if you like, a certain kind of prejudice that sneaks into every human existence 
I notice it in my own, where not only do you identify with what you are, but you identify against what they are. And all of those other people, that's just about everybody else, were called Gentiles, and they added a word to it, sinners of the Gentiles, or the uncircumcised. Well, that was a lot of people, and it was easy to deal with them. It's sort of uh, your your full-time way of saying them. And the Bible and history is full of examples in which they said, us do not have any dealings with them. That's how we know who us is. I was just down in uh, Ontario, driving through familiar places with my wife and reflecting on our short lives here in Canada and reflecting on the easy way it was to order our prejudices against whichever immigrant group was coming in. They became the them. You could laugh at them, you could mock their religion, you could do all kinds of things like that in the days of your ignorance before you realized what you were doing. And then came Jesus who starts off his ministry by bringing in the wrong kind of people right into the midst. He brings Jews together with Gentiles. He brings men together with women. And he says, of all of the groups that are brought together, the uh, uh, people outside of Israel and people inside Israel, particularly Samaritans, deal with it because in this kingdom, the doors are open. And we invite them all to come. It caused a problem then, it caused a problem today. And in his cross, in his resurrection, and the following gift of the Holy Spirit, there was a sense of the opening up of God's heart to forgive, to embrace, to bring in. As long as, even among those who had spoken with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, as long as it helped Jews become better Jews and Gentiles become Jews in the first place. Jesus talked about Pharisees who would cross land and sea to make one convert. That's not a huge harvest. Indicating that this didn't happen that very often. The odd Gentile showed up who had submitted to circumcision and begun to master the 613, by some estimate, commandments about uncleanness alone that existed, and you can read in the book of Leviticus today. This was the early church. It was a place full of joy. It was a place full of joyous Jews. Some who believed in Jesus and some who did not, who lived together in glorious fellowship, centered in Jerusalem until one day word comes in that an entire family an entire family of Gentiles has been without circumcision nor even the slightest inclination to follow unclean and clean restrictions been baptized and brought into the fellowship Not only that, but that the people who had done this were observant Jews who up until that time had known they were Jews because they never so much as crossed the threshold of a Gentile home. And now they'd walked right into the place and baptized these people and brought them into the fellowship. Can you hear it? Who let them in? Which is exactly where our story starts. When the news travels fast, that somebody's opened the door without their permission. Do you know what I want to say? Here's the message for this morning. Who asked our permission? Who asked our permission? God is the one who brought them in, as we'll see. Who asked our permission? These non-Jewish outsiders are in and all of the questions of uncleanness arise. By virtue of the very contact, a Jew in contact with a Gentile was unclean and had to go through a process in order to become ceremonially clean. That's what the cleanness means, able to worship again. 
But by that association, if it was perpetuated, there were a whole lot of other people who would not associate with them. And all the friendships they'd made would be shattered. This was a problem. It was a huge problem. It would continue to be a problem, especially if it was God who was opening the doors and letting them come in. And so Peter gets called in the carpet in the text this morning and asked to give an answer. Did you do this? And are you putting us and ruining our good name and putting us in an awkward position by what you did? And Peter lays it out from the beginning, step by step. So important is this story in the book of Acts that the actual event is recorded in an entire chapter, chapter 10, chapter 11. is nothing more than Peter's testimony. We've got the shorter version. That's how important it is in the book of Acts. And from the beginning, he describes that he goes to Joppa, a good Jew, and stays at Simon the Tanner's house, a good Jew, and there, participating in all of the kosher uh, rules, Peter decides that he will go up on the roof to pray, and as he does so, falls into a trance. And down from heaven in his trance comes a sheet inside of which are all the animals he's been taught his entire life never to touch. Uh, I guess he thinks in his trance it's fascinating to look at them, so <laughs> looking isn't unclean, but touching is. Until he hears a voice that says, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And his response is, never touch the stuff. And it disappears. A second time that happens. A third time that happens. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And then the Spirit says to him, somebody's coming to meet you at the door. And he hears a knock. It's actually at the gate. How could he have known that miles away, while he is encountering this, there is another man who is not a Jew, but who has learned three things. One is prayer. One is justice. One is care for the poor. And the man who has learned this is a hard-bitten, hardcore Sylvester Stallone, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Roman centurion. <laughs> I could use some other terms to describe. You don't get to be a Roman centurion by being a nice guy. And he is in command. And his authority is to exercise command. And somehow he has learned through following the God of Israel and praying to the God of Israel while uncircumcised and unclean how to mingle justice with governance. And his life, please notice this, has been transformed on his way to inclusion. Can I say that again? Transformed on the way to inclusion. We've got an argument today in the church around the world about those two words. Inclusion on the one hand, transformation on the other. And this text simply says to us that both are to be wedded together and that frequently God is transforming people prior to their inclusion. So the question that could be asked is not simply who let them in, but who is God transforming? What's God doing out there in the world? For in the process of prayer, this man, seeing a vision of a man before him, says to him, I want you to go to a certain Simon the Tanner's house. There's a man there named Simon. Get him, bring him. He will tell you about your own eternal life. Who is in charge of this? Who is in charge of the trance, the spirit speaking? Who is in charge of the man who appears and tells a Roman centurion to go look up a Jew? Absolutely no one. By the way, for some of you who are saying, I think people who go by dreams are a little bit, you know, off. <laughs> you live in a rationalistic world, but I can tell you that if you step outside this world to anywhere else on earth, you will discover people who consider dreams one of the primary transmitters of God's voice. To this very day, at this very second, and for years prior to this, I, from my position at the university, have heard over and over and over again Muslim people who have shown up at a Christian's doorstep saying that Jesus appeared to them the night before, Isamasi, as they say, and told them to come 
to ask how they can believe. Now that might not be politically correct. And I think it would be dumb for somebody to say, hooray for our side. But for anybody to deny that this is going on and a hundred other ways in which that is happening is simply to live with our heads in the sand and refuse to ask the question that was asked in this text and needs to be asked today. What is God doing in our world before he's ever asked us? Peter's met by three Roman soldiers who said, we've got somebody who'd like to see you. And he and six others, good Jews, crossed the threshold of a Gentile's home knowing what that means under the authority of Almighty God who changed the rules. And as the centurion breaks his story, I was told by God to go get you, what have you got to say? Peter, who had no idea, this was a preaching moment, stands there and tells him the only thing he knows, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what God has done through Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and the new creation that's come. And he remembers the words, if God says it's okay, it's okay. Those were the words he heard when he said, I'm not eating any of that stuff. If God says it's okay, it's okay. More specifically, if I've pronounced it clean, don't you pronounce it unclean. And reminds Peter that even though he can go back in his own Bible with his Bible open and say, look, it says here in Leviticus, I can't eat this, that before Leviticus, in Genesis, it says, and God saw that it was good, all of his creation. It's God's way of saying to Peter, there's a new creation. We're dialing back to zero, zero base assessment. All things are becoming new. I have pronounced this clean. Don't you pronounce it unclean. And over the threshold, with a heart beating just as fast as Mary said today, go seven Jews into the house of a Gentile, wondering what in the world God's got in mind. Every time the church provides for its own safety by the exclusion of others, so that it never gets its feathers ruffled by a woman who shows up in a little black dress or any other thing, God's doing something somewhere that it will miss and to that extent its own life is in jeopardy. And as Peter preaches the gospel, he says before he gets six sentences out, <laughs> if you go prior to that, there's a few more than that. It doesn't really matter. The same thing that happened in Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the speaking with other tongues so that everybody heard, and that is the point, everybody heard the gospel, for it is for everybody, so did these Gentiles. The modern charismatic movement began when a whole cluster of Pentecostals were asked by a whole cluster, cluster of Presbyterians <laughs> back in the 60s to tell them about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And they met in the basement. And those Pentecostals told them about the gift of the Holy Spirit that they had experienced in the Pentecostal revival with the gift of speaking with tongues and crossed the basement floor and laid hands on the Presbyterians and prayed for them. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And a movement began there that it crossed from Pentecostalism into the Presbyterian movement. It would go to the Anglican movement, into the United Church, and in so many other places where God simply said, I'm breaking down a barrier. Here we go. When Peter went back, he looked to them and said, what was I supposed to do? If God gave them the spirit as he gave at the start, the signal of the brand new creation, that swept my objections away. And so it was. They said, yes, 
If that's the case, if God actually did that, then God's given the Gentiles life as well. Isn't that wonderful? You know what else they said? Let the Gentiles worship in their own church and we'll worship in the synagogue. <laughs> it would take generation upon generation to bring about the actual integration, the actual inclusion that God intends for his people. And ultimately, there were many in the synagogue who said enough and separated from those who follow Jesus. One of the most tragic divisions in human history. For if I understand anything from this scripture, is that God's plan is that inclusion and transformation be part of the world's experience and the church's regular practice. That we look out there in the world around us and say, what is God doing? And be prepared to be upset. <laughs> because he reserves the right to pour out of his spirit on people whom we thought were so far away. It's no, there's no point in even thinking about it. And I'm drawing them here. I'm speaking to a congregation <clears throat> whom, in, in my words, have a history of throwing a line in the water. That is, seeing who's out there in the water wanted to grasp the line and be reeled in. And so you began to extend yourself and open up and offer, for instance, space to people who wanted to serve the poor around here and uh, bring in the arts community. And I looked at that and I thought, that's what's talked about here. Looking out there and saying, what's God doing first? And then trying to make accommodations to embrace it. And I guess the only question I have is, where's that at right now? That's still alive? We're at a moment when we can become obsessed with ourselves. And there's important things we need to be concerned about with regard to our own self. But we still got that vision, that line in the water, several of them perhaps, asking what's God doing out there? How is he moving? Who's he transforming? Where's he pouring out his spirit? How can we embrace them even if it's awkward? in order to bring him in. The uh, Pentecostal movement I just mentioned, which advertised itself as a full gospel movement, and I'm certainly not gonna criticize that, nevertheless was begun by a black man who discovered very quickly as the gospel spread and the Pentecostal experience spread, that black and white would stay absolutely separate, though he prayed fervently that they'd worship together in the same pews in the same congregation. and racial segregation would end. It did not. It still hasn't. Not even there. In the 60s, a church participating in that movement and experiencing the fullness of the Spirit of Christ poured out upon them and realizing this is a white church. Realizing that God's plan was the inclusion of East and West, North and South, barbarian, Scythian, bond free, male, female, everyone together, was approached by a black church and said that that church said, we'd like to buy your property. And the white church said, why don't you just join with us? And the black church said, we wanna own property and we can't own property everywhere in this city, the city was Chicago. And so, no, we don't want to join with you. We'd like you to move out because we can't own property everywhere and you can. And so for the sake of owning property, once again, we missed, we missed the inclusion that can come and that God wants to bring that binds us together with cords that cannot be broken. The challenge that exists for every congregation, every denomination, for all of us, is simply this, if God's changed the rules, and if he did it without asking us, and he did, can we become the people and stay the people who are prepared to be upset, a little disrupted, making room for the new thing God's doing in our midst? and therefore participating in the salvation he's still bringing around the world. God bless you.